Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Humanitarian Policy Group and this very special discussion on the impacts of a historic year for humanitarian action. I'm so delighted to see that so many of you can join us from across the world. Do please introduce yourself in the chat function so that we know what countries and what people are joining us. I'm Saoirse O'Callaghan, I'm the Director of the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI and I'm delighted to be joined today with such leading experts on humanitarian action. Before I introduce you to them, I'm just going to briefly, briefly set the scene. Here in the Humanitarian Policy Group, our editors forbid us to use the word unprecedented. Apparently nothing in humanitarian action, nothing in humanitarian politics is unprecedented. But I would like to think that this is somewhat of an unprecedented year. Today, we're going to take stock of the major events and their implications for humanitarian action going forward. What has it meant to be living through crisis while we respond to crisis? What has political unrest and protests in the US meant for leadership going forwards? How will questions and debates of racism in our societies in our organizations and in our sector influence the aid sector as we move forward? Many say that crises are a moment and a disruptive opportunity. The language we hear coming from the US is one of more of repair and restore. So how much is 2020 a turning point for the humanitarian system? How much is there a burning platform in a sector that has proved highly resistant to change? We're going to consider these questions and more today. We know that many of you joining today are experts from across the humanitarian sector. So we want your reflections, we want your questions. Please put your thoughts into the chat as we move through this conversation. And this includes feedback for HPG. This event is falling at a time of the year where the Humanitarian Policy Group is considering our research agenda. And we hope that this conversation will inspire new ideas and new reflections for what HPG should be focusing on for the future. So to kick, off, kick us off today, we want to first have a poll. We want to hear from you what you think the events of, the moment, of this momentous year will mean and whether it will cause a reset of the humanitarian system. So click now on the poll and let us know what you think. Is it going to be a turning point? Is it business as usual? Or are we going to see small changes, but not yet a reset? Please put your thoughts into the poll now and we'll return to it later. So please do also use the question and answer box to send us through questions. How we're going to do this event is we're going to have five minutes each from each of the panelists and then we're going to have a conversation. So we're interested to get your, your thoughts and your questions as we move through the discussion. Well, if you're on Twitter, we'll be using the hashtag humanitarian reset for this event. And this and other Twitter handles are now in the chat so you can use them. For those that need them, closed captions are available during the event and just please click the bottom at the bottom of your screen. And just a reminder that we're being recorded so that we can use this event um, and post it later online and we can watch back later. So now I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our panel. First off, I would like to welcome Ambassador Ruben Brigitte. Ambassador Brigitte is currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of the South in Tennessee. He formerly served as the US Ambassador to the African Union, as well as the Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of State in the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, and has held a number of other interesting and important posts. And a very warm welcome to Nasra Ismail. Nasra is a humanitarian expert on Somalia, where she was the director of the Somalia NGO Consortium, as well as the Somalia country director for Oxfam International. Nasra is now the associate director of programs at Co-Impact in the US. Also very, very pleased to be joined by Ben Ramalingham, Ben's a leading thinker on innovation, and he wears many, many hats, including with OECD, IDS, and as a senior research associate with ODI. Ben's currently writing a book 
drawing learning from crisis management in different sectors and how we can be creative in times of disaster. And a big congratulations to you, Ben, on your new appointment as the director of the new UK Humanitarian Innovation Hub. And finally, to Hugo Slim. I'm really delighted that you're joining us, Hugo, today. Many of you know Hugo as the former head of policy and humanitarian diplomacy at the ICRC. Hugo is now a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict at Oxford. Um, and he's written extensively on conflict, on protection, and on the ethics of humanitarian aid. So before we hear from the panel, let's just take a brief look at the poll um, and see what the findings are telling us. Okay, so not too much optimism that we're going to see a reset. Let's see if our panel have any different thoughts. So over to you first, Ambassador Brigitte, to tell us what you see in terms of the US politics um, mm -hmm. of, of this year and what they mean for humanitarian action and the humanitarian system moving forwards. Uh, well, Sorsha and uh, my friends on the panel and colleagues around the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you uh, may be hailing from. It's an honor for me to be with you. Uh, in the interests of time, uh, let me just tailor my remarks to a couple of things. And let's start with first things first. It is in this question, the fundamental question that's been posed of continuity or change, particularly in the context of this remarkable year 2020, what does it mean for humanitarian action? And the first order of business is to keep our eye on the ball, which is the first thing, the operating principle of humanitarian action is to focus on immediate human suffering and human dignity of those that are in need of the assistance. The reason I say that is because it, when we have these sorts of discussions, it, one, it, it is obviously um, both appropriate um, and also useful to think about all the other sorts of things that it means in terms of how we structure our, our uh, area delivery systems. What does diversity mean in terms of leadership? How do we actually decenter um, our work from sort of the global West to the to the, um, uh, to the developing world? And we can often, quite frankly, sometimes get um, overly focused on the providers and the politics of the assistance as opposed to the beneficiaries themselves. Everything has to start from that premise. So in that context, as, uh, as I've, I've been asked to sort of talk a bit about what this means from the American perspective, let me uh, approach what I think 2020 uh, means for, um, for the, the global humanitarian enterprise um, in the context of what I think it absolutely is an unprecedented year uh, in American history. So we have um, just completed uh, one of the most remarkable American elections um, with record turnout, uh, with the uh, sitting president of the United States getting uh, more votes than any other incumbent president in American history and still losing because of the overwhelming uh, number of other Americans, both in terms of raw numbers and also in terms of the Electoral College, uh, that were profoundly concerned with the direction that America has taken over the last four years. Now, there are lots of reasons for this, and one can debate all of that, but for the perspective of our conversation today, I would submit that there are two. The first is um, the Trump administration's approach to the rest of the world, which can be summarized in two words, America first. Um, which necessarily means in the context of everything else that I've just said, if we're focused pr primarily on the question of the beneficiaries of humanitarian assistance, which almost necessarily means people that are not our own citizens and people who are not from our own similar polities, being able to focus on that necessarily means being able to see one's interest embodied in the other however one be, is able to define that. Someone who is from another country, who is from another life experience, someone who is from a, uh, a, a, a different historical perspective, and crucially somebody who by definition is living in a completely different set of circumstances other than those of the benefactor. If you cannot make common cause with them, 
then it's hard to see how you can be a leader in humanitarian action. And I think that has been, uh, quite frankly, the most challenging aspect of the Trump years as it relates to this, is this reframing of America's place in the world to be fundamentally selfish, <laughs> um, rather than being a, a, a leader who sees, at least in part, the nature of our common humanity, not only being a reflection of our values, but also a reflection of our interests. And the reason that this is actually so unprecedented is that the nature of humanitarian assistance for the last several decades has largely been a bipartisan issue in American body politic. Whether that be the launching of PEPFAR, the largest public health program uh, by a single uh, overseas public health program by a single country in American history under uh, George, uh, George W. Bush, or the consistent uh, leadership of the United States in refugee resettlement, uh, re resettling more than often most of the world combined. Um, to the nature of the bipartisan support for refugee or and humanitarian assistance accounts in the United States. These are all things uh, that have traditionally crossed party lines for a variety of reasons, um, and yet have been fundamentally called to question in the last four years. Um, and quite frankly, um, and with the most egregious example being how the United States has, on the last four years, has treated uh, families trying to enter the United States across our southern border, separating children from their parents forcibly, to the point where we can't even sort of, we, we literally cannot even find their parents anymore. It's outrageous. Um, which is a separate question from what U.S. immigration policy ought to be. Um, this is much more of a moral question with regard to what does it mean to see common humanity and to drive policies from them. Now, the reason this matters in the context of uh, the current political moment is because the United States right now is as bitterly and evenly divided as it has been at any time since the American Civil War. And so this question of who America is and what our place in the world should be is still unsettled, notwithstanding the nature of the, of the, of the previous um, uh, election results of the last couple of weeks. And as someone who has spent a fair portion of my professional life uh, writing about or an active service um, uh, to my government on this issue set, one of the things that worries me most about the nature of the, Amer of the global humanitarian system and America's place in it is that I worry desperately that what the world is seeing with regard to American leadership is that, you know, to borrow a, an analogy from American football, um, typically we play between the 40 yard lines or to, you know, from, from you know, global football somewhere in the middle of the pitch, right? Um, but we have seen this administration with large support of half the American public take things way off uh, to the very edge of the field, which means that the rest of the world is learning how to move forward without American leadership. And so the question that is that remains unanswered and yet to be determined, two of them, one, how will the world receive America when America is back um, on the pitch uh, with regard to everything from the nature of refugee resettlement to fully re-engaging in, um, in the resolution of, uh, of, of armed conflicts, which lead to the nature of uh, humanitarian displacement, humanitarian needs in the first place? And second, can the American political project sustain American leadership going forward? so long as half of our population does not see America's interest as being at least in part laid common cause with a shared fundamental humanity of those in most desperate in need around the world. And so I see, view this problem from two ends. The first is the stuff that we've always been talking about, right? Which is, you know, so what is the nature of American sort of practical leadership in terms of funding, in terms of norm, norm setting in the rest of the world, in terms of actually um, supporting international institutions? 
But the more fundamental question, quite frankly, that I'm seized with is how do we reset the American domestic political agenda away from America first to a more principled engagement with the rest of the world? So um, that's my contribution for the moment. And I look forward to chatting with you in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Ambassador. And I think this question of the interplay between the domestic and the international, it's, it's absolutely pronounced in the US at the moment, but it's certainly not unique to the US. And I think it's quite a fundamental question and we can maybe turn to it later in the discussion. But Nasra, over to you. You've brought really interesting perspectives when we spoke about, uh, when we spoke earlier about your experiences in Somalia and now having, living in the US and how you've seen parallels. So yeah, interested in your key takeaways. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sorcha. And, and thanks really to the whole ODI HPH team for gathering us on this important occasion. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are listening to this and joining us today. I'm very delighted uh, to be joining everyone and you know, very pleased to be with my fellow co-panelists, people that I admire. Very, very difficult, Sorcha, to follow Ambassador Brighetti, who has really laid down some of the most important stories, uh, particularly the political one that I think that has captured all of us um, in terms of America's changing leadership and what it means both for itself, but also for the rest of the world. I, find myself caught between those two narratives. I'm both a Somali, but also an American. And so in some ways I, I feel like I was, um, you know, my life has been bookended by different crises. So, so, so here's what I had uh, been thinking about over the last few days as I've been looking forward to this event. So, you know, for me, when I reflected on this year and particularly the many lessons that everybody that I've been talking to has said, you know, there's so many lessons to be drawn. There are those that are, um, uh, appropriate uh, as the ambassador laid out, we need to focus on the needs of the many who have been marginalized by what's been happening, but also focus it in a way that is dignified. Um, but what comes to mind for me is, you know, like any good student of history, it's not to, to, to understand where we are, to better understand our current affairs, it behooves us to look back, even if we have perhaps the perfect vision of a 2020 uh, in our uh, uh, currently. So what happened, I kept asking myself in the last decade or even the decade before, we all know Facebook that likes to remind us to look back at the memories of the last year or two or several. So I asked myself, well, what did happen in early 2000? I was a young student in Washington, DC in the midst of my first college years, a freshman year that would conclude like what I thought like many uh, before me, I returned home a year away uh, from, from my family and outside the ego with the idealism of a 19 year old woman taking on the world, convinced that she had reached adulthood, but really very far from it. But unfortunately it began with the outset of 9-11. My world changed forever then. And that was the beginning of the early 2000s for me. It would be the first lesson for me that indeed crisis, no matter what age I was in, crisis could happen anywhere and America was not immune to that kind of fragility. In the decade to follow, um, in the decade to follow, I witnessed more fragility, believe it or not. Just five years later than that year, the climate related crisis that fell upon many Americans, many of them African Americans, that of Hurricane Katrina hitting the Gulf Coast, costing more than 2000 lives, uh, and ultimately ending up um, an estimated 125 billion in damages. Another five years later after that, the East African drought of, 2000, of 2010 up to 2011 would hit several countries in the horn. My own beloved country of Somalia would witness the worst drought that would then result in a famine of its history since independence in 1960. With a nearly 250,000 Somalis lost just due to the fact that they didn't have water or food. And the country really, to my surprise, in the last uh, decade has never really um, recovered from such an event. An event like that would catapult me also to leave one home, America, to also go back to Somalia to be part of a rebuilding. So in some ways, the first decade, 2000, 2010, full of crises, but nothing like the ones that we've been dealing with this year. More recently, in the last eight years, we've witnessed the birth of Black Lives Matter. I remember in 2013, after an unarmed, beautiful, young Black uh, teenager gunned down in 2012 by a man twice his age, a movement that began by two young feminists, believe it or not, enraged by the lack of accountability and rising brutality of Black lives on American soil. What was happening there in my original home 
a different kind of crisis. This one that was the first home, the home that I grew up in, a different kind of crisis. Another movement just three years ago, just 2017, uh, would spread around the world, sexual abuse in the hills of Hollywood. And it would follow the term that Tarana Burke, its founder, Me Too, would be sprung right across social media. Millions and millions of girls and women raising their hands, saying that they have faced a crisis of vulnerability to their bodies and to their rights. And of course, not much would follow, nothing to the amount of pure, unadulterated accountability. It would be seen, it would be heard, it would be witnessed, but yet the kind of accountability we've been looking for for young girls and women was not something that we had seen. How many other crises have I, have I thought of recently as well? The Yemen, the Syria crisis, the crisis that we see in the non sort of human world and the species that we've lost to wildfires across the world over the last three years. I guess the point I'm getting at is perhaps nothing is unoriginal about this crisis of 2020. It isn't really all that new in terms of if you consider who has been made vulnerable, who has died. Is it a simple fact that we are all bound now in the home? Is it a simple fact that this is an invisible crisis that has grounded our ways of working, our ways of living, our ways of commuting? To date, nearly one and a half million lives have been lost to this virus, and it's projected to be more with a vaccine in sight. The deaths of countless Black Americans, including George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many more who should be named, ignited a global movement to march to, to ask ourselves better questions, tougher questions of those who say that they protect and they serve us. To make things worse, we now look forward to a future that isn't all that hopeful to my knowledge. Just look at the growing inequality rates. The rich are getting richer by the second. And the gender report from this year just confirmed my worst nightmare, that we will not reach gender parity in my lifetime or our lifetime. It will take 100 years. I guess I come away with 2020 with a collective vulnerability. That's the only thing that I've come to know. Many people have been made vulnerable. But I guess this year, the truth is we are all vulnerable. Nobody is safe not your skin color, not your class, whether you belong to the global north or the global south makes no difference. 2020 is the year that has made the entire globe vulnerable. So what do I take away? What is the hope that everybody is going to be asking me over the next few months? I guess I don't have much, but I have two things that I have found to be comforting. One is no one is safe and no systems will endure forever in the same way. We must rethink. We have to rethink and look at all of our assumptions about richness, about whiteness, about poverty, about marginalization. Nothing is what it was before and nothing will probably go. We have to start new. The second thing, the only thing that I've come away from January to this moment is love. It is the love that I have for my uh, family, for my neighbors, for my friends, for the community that I say I serve in my professional role. It is love that I'm going to have to lean on. That will be my governing principle. It is that that I can probably say I'm going to hang my hat on over the next year, decade, whatever comes our way. Thank you. Thank you, Nasra. And what I really like about your remarks, Nasra, is just how much the personal and the professional have interplayed. And I think a really important reminder that this is not a theoretical discussion about crisis, um, but actually they're real lives and real people and real issues that, that really matter. Um, and thank you for, for bringing that home. Um, and thank you for, yeah, for, I guess, your own personal journey through that as well. So thank you. Um, ben, turning to you, I guess my big question to, to someone like you who thinks about these issues and how innovation and change happens is, you know, the degree to which we are on a burning platform, the degree to which, you know, some of the things that Nasra has been saying about all of our assumptions and, you know, all of our presumptions are now being debunked. Um, whether this is enough where we're going to see enough disruption to engineer new forms of change, new forms of innovation, or, you know, are we going to, in a sector that's so resistant to change, is it going to be business as usual, as many of our uh, pollsters thought uh, when we introduced that poll. So over to you. Thank, thanks so much, Sosha. It's really wonderful to be speaking to you all, to the audience, and along such, such luminaries in the humanitarian sector. I think I want to actually begin my reflections with a quick rhetorical question. 
Who listening or watching has any actual hard cash in any of their pockets or wallets right now? Actual money in the form of hard physical cash. Now, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but the data indicates that the amount of cash being used just in major capital cities around the world has dropped by 50 to 75% in the six months since the pandemic hit compared to 2019. Now, this was originally because of the overall fall in transactions in the first lockdown, but cash has stayed low while electronic payments have increased. And this wholesale shift has come about because of institutional adaptation by businesses, rapid technological adoption, and importantly, lots and lots of individual consumer attitudes and behavior changes. Now, in large part, this is a considerable, and on one level, a disruptive change, but it's taking place in the context of existing business models, assumptions, ideas, and existing relationships between suppliers, retailers, and customers. Now, while it might seem radical or disruptive for sheer speed and volume, I'd argue it's actually a digital tweak on an unchanged set of assumptions, practices, dynamics, culture around sales, purchases, and actually about consumerism. And I want to argue in my remaining minutes that this change is a perfect analogy for the kinds of changes we've seen in the humanitarian sector since the COVID-19 pandemic struck. So let me step back and give you a bit of context and a bigger picture on this. There's no doubt that the events of this year have paid the greatest challenge to organizations and sectors across the public, private, and not-for-profit sector, almost within living memory. So regardless of the sector or the focus of the providence of these organizations, the organizations on which our large, lives largely rely have faced transformations in the demand for their services and their offerings, new client and customer needs and expectations, and they've had to deal with these alongside profound challenges because of the health and safety restrictions imposed by governments around the world due to COVID-19. So how does this play out in the humanitarian sector? I think we've seen some of the fundamentals of the traditional humanitarian business model being challenged. So first and most obviously, restrictions on movement, on social contact, on gathering, both nationally and internationally. The centrality of national governments as the de facto coordinator, leader and instigator of crisis response. The integration of those crisis responses, not as a silo, but firmly integrated within wider economic, political and security agendas, often really considerably shaped by them. Uh, and we've seen profound challenges in fragile and conflict affected states where the healthcare systems have already been decimated. Now, what does the data tell us? And I actually think ACAPS, which is one of the organizations that we know to many in the sector, have been a real public good for the sector over the last six to six months to a year and before. And they, they did a survey of humanitarians and they, they found that 60% of organizations saw reduced access to their services by populations, by affected populations. 75% of organizations saw implementation of projects impacted. 20% had to radically reduce or halt their operations. Only 1% of all humanitarian organizations reported no impacts whatsoever. Now, despite those changes, there have been, um, there's been a continuation of operations with some adaptations. 80% of organizations report on focusing just on essential activities. 70% indicate they reallocated many of their activities to COVID-19. Around half of organizations engaged in really rapid capacity building for local staff, for local organizations, or for affected populations. And around a quarter of all organizations surveyed prioritized cash-based assistance. And yet, despite those operational adaptations, a little bit like digitalizing cash and using digital transactions, these, there are wider changes that haven't taken place and they really haven't yet featured in the way the sector has operated. Uh, and Nazra highlighted race. The COVID-19 crisis have exposed frailties and tensions that have built up over many years and decades in the wider world. Race is one major issue and many organizations that are up outside of the humanitarian sector are seeing this as a strategic inflection point for the sector. Now, despite a few debates and discussions, Actual actions have been thin on the ground. I've yet to see a genuine statement from a humanitarian leader about the importance of race for their organization and what they're gonna be doing about it. Second, there's been a massive rise in voluntarism around the world. 
uh, community vol volunteerism, and much like there was after the refugee crisis in the last uh, few years that Nasra talked about, but it's not really been capitalized on or engaged with by humanitarian organizations. And there's been little resulting change in the way the traditional aid architecture works. There's been a global crisis, and this has created, if you like, and if you forgive the phrase, a living lab of experimentation. We should be able to learn from anywhere where, because the crisis is impacting every crisis country at the same time. There have been some great examples. Relatives, Massachusetts, for example, has deployed a contact and tracing system which leverages lessons and experiences from across Africa in response to Ebola. But really, humanitarian responders have not been playing the role that they could be playing as a broker in such efforts. Uh, perhaps most importantly, funding flows have not fo followed the ambition of empowering local responders, even in a crisis where they're really well established and we're really well placed to respond. Just 0.1% of total funding reported for the COVID-19 response has gone directly to national and local organisations. And then the final one is, despite the carbon footprint issues and despite the looming climate crisis, it seems to me that we cannot wait to get back on planes. Um, the data that we have from the 2020, that 1% of all elite, of elite flyers, 1% of flyers are responsible for half of all emissions. And they define, defined elite flyers as those of us who fly more than three long haul flights a year. So we in the humanitarian sector are clearly among the super emitters in the world. And this is before we engage with the more profound challenges of actually greening the humanitarian response and greening humanitarian futures. So I would argue that despite the clear space of transformative change, we've not yet seen the majority of humanitarian organizations really grasp the pandemic as a way of transforming their way of doing business. Instead, there's an ethos of we will change what we have to, when we have to. And the institutional way to the past hasn't given way to new ways of thinking. And we've actually, let's be really uh, kind of clear cut. Many other sectors have done the same, manufacturing, retail, uh, the restaurant sector, fact, there are many, many sectors that are doing the same thing. We've, we've attempted, like these others, to shore up status and resources and control. Now, what's the answer to this? I actually think, despite what many people might argue, that we have courage and leadership in our sector by the bucket load. But sustained and meaningful change will take more creativity. It will take more willingness to give up power and status, more willingness to trust and respect those who are different to us more humility and more empathy, not just from us as individuals, but from our institutions. And these qualities have been notable mostly because of their absence. I just wanna close with this one point. Research I've been doing on forced experimentation, experimentation under pressure, suggests that this isn't actually an uncommon finding. Only about one in 20 of us will respond to with novelty in the face of stress or pressure. One in 20, and it will dif di differ in different situations. I believe, and I've seen that there are already positive deviants that are working in new and creative ways at the margins of the system. And I believe we urgently have to find and amplify their efforts if we're serious about change. Thank you. You're muted, Sorsha. <clears throat> just, I was just saying, help us help us to take stock of all of these fascinating insights and whether we need new frameworks, new ethics, new forms of action that can take account of, I guess, all of these new dimensions that we're hearing. Very interested to, to, to hear from you, what you take from all of this. Gosh, that's a, that's a bit of a big ask. I was hoping I could do what last speakers always do and say, well, there's nothing left for me to say because they've all said it so brilliantly, which they have, but now you want me to say something completely new. So my view on 2020 is that it's been a really significant year. And because I'm always a bit optimistic, I ticked the top box hoping we would have a real change now in the humanitarian sector. For me, the key thing about this year, and I want to talk about, um, in a sense, how the system can change and then talk about how the organizations, the ones that, that Ben has given us so many good facts, need to change. For me this year, COVID and climate have emerged as everyone's emergencies. And I think this is really important. We've had cyclones, floods, and 
extraordinary levels of fires across the world as well, as well as COVID. And my sense is one of the significant things about 2020 is that we are finally going to achieve um, increased salience beyond conflict. So these things, COVID and climate, will become more and more important than conflict. And I think in a way, if we look at the humanitarian sector for the last 30 years from sort of you know, Bosnia, post-Cold War onwards, we have seen it dominated by conflict, a conflict mindset, a predominance of conflict approaches. Now, I think that needs to change now, and I hope it will change. I think we now need um, to see some real relevance and rebalance towards disasters and climate disasters in particular. So, you know, coming from the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement recently, you know, for me, this would mean that if the last 20, 30 years has been the sort of high watermark of the ICRC and the conflict model and the conflict approach, I really um, hope for several reasons that in fact, the next turn in humanitarian action will be the time of the International Federation and the national societies um, really working at community level in a different way around deep structural um, crisis around climate and um, disease and other things. So I hope we'll have that change. And I think if we're going to have that change, there are a couple of things that are really important that have been shown this year. And the first one is I think we need to end this sort of monoculture in humanitarian action around the Swiss model of principled humanitarian action. And, you know, it seems strange for me to say this because I've been championing it all through the sort of conflict phase, and I think it's been very important. But I don't think it's right now to dominate humanitarian response. And I often, you know, listen to humanitarian workers, and I've done some work in a couple of areas recently, where it just isn't working. But agencies feel, but we've got to stay to our principles, so we've got to be neutral and impartial and independent. And I'm thinking, why? Try something else. Try something else. So let go of some of those principles. Not everybody has to follow this Swiss model in a sense, I think. So that's one thing. I think, it's, I think the principles are stifling creativity. I think the conflict mindset is around principled humanitarian action is stifling creativity. The second thing I think we need to do, and I think you know, Ben was saying, it's, it, and, and others were saying it started to happen because of COVID, is to get out of the way. So I think a lot of the big humanitarian organizations had to get out of the way, they wanted to get out of the way so they didn't catch COVID in the last uh, few months. I think we should stay out of the way as much as we can, because as Ben said, and as we've all seen in our own lives and every community we've been in, there has been a bursting of new models, if you like, of new flowers beginning to, to, to flower and flourish. Mutual aid, community-based organizations, local government, um, national government, and I think a recognition too of duties over rights, I'm not over, but a rebalancing towards, we all have duties to each other in a crisis like this. We're gonna need that for the climate crisis. So I think the big agencies should get out of the way and let that social contract develop and let those, those models develop as much as possible um, and not just reimpose their model on, on the world. So we want to see, um, the decolonization of aid. I think it's very important that other movement that's arisen and finally got sort of, um, you know, cut through this year, we've got to um, change that model. And in a way, the Western system that's, that's really operated since 1984 to 2020 has done an amazing thing. It's spread a principle and practice of international humanitarian response across international society in international relations, but they can't do it all for two reasons. First of all, their access is usually maximum 50%. And secondly, their funding is peaking now and dropping. So that's the, that's the high watermark of the funding for the Western bubble of humanitarian action. It's going to go down. So get out of the way, make room for other people, make room for other methods and models of work, and see who else can drive it um, once you decolonize it much more. And let's see what community organizations come forward. Let's see what the big question marks to China and India around South-South cooperation. They don't want to fund the Western model, the OECD club. So are they going to really kick in in a different way on South-South cooperation and really deliver a new form of humanitarian safety net as well? So that's my, my point about what has been opened up in 2020, I think. Um, and the message there is the model and the messenger 
need to change. It needs to look different and be different, I think. And I hope it will be. The next point is about the big organizations and Ben's asking the question, you know, will they change? Um, are they into all this? Are they gonna do it? And I'm afraid my, my view on a lot of these big organizations, um, and I've seen you know, quite a bit of them recently, is that they are self-serving. They do have a self-serving bias programmed into them. And you watch them at the moment, you know, on Twitter or anything, and they see COVID and they'll grab it and claim it. We're the answer to COVID, we'll do it. Disability this week, we're the answer to disability, we'll do disability, fund us and we'll do disability. So you get this incredible self-serving bias in the big oligopoly agencies and they won't give that away. I really don't think they will. They'll get less and less money and need to adjust themselves over the next couple of years. They won't do anything radical in changing their business model like Oxfam has done and actually like Australian Red Cross has done. I think the only way to change that is if they don't give away their power, organizations, new organizations, governments, local governments need to take it away from them and um, change the model on the ground somehow. The last thing I'm gonna say is I think the really great opportunity we have now to test, develop, prove this a new model for the world is the COVID vaccine rollout. We're all gonna be working on that. We need to have it ethical, fair, distributed, every person, gaps covered, conflict, whatever. And that offers a whole new model of infrastructure for us from community-based volunteers, cold chain networks, mixing government, volunteers, um, you know, mutual aid groups, whatever. We're gonna get a whole new structure there if we get it right, and that can be the future. And that can be the platform that we need globally. New model, new people, new organizations, to, to build the next generation of humanitarian action on. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to pick up one point that has come up, I think, between all of you um, and hand back to you, Ambassador. Um, is this interplay between the domestic and the international? And I think we've all had slightly different takes on this. And one of the comments in the, the questions from Sean Lowry is, is welcome back America, but also a question as to whether the rest of the world trusts the enduring benevolence of the US leadership. Um, and this issue that you raised about making sure that there is a recognition of common humanity um, and common cause, and that engaging in humanitarian crisis is one that should have a common interest for us all. But I guess one question that I have is, is one about that issue of trust and international trust that's come up through the questions. And the other, a little bit what, building on what Hugo has just said, is that there's both an opportunity and a risk emerging out of COVID, that actually rather than it being seen as a common cause, that actually, it will be seen in opposition and domestic interests, whether it's for the vaccine, whether it's for PPE, um, will be seen as actually um, in tension with um, international issues. So I'm wondering, can I pass that back to you? This issue of, yeah, this common cause and how do we make sure that there isn't a continued tension, um, whether there is an opportunity, I guess, um, to build trust um, in, in US leadership, but also whether with COVID um, we're going to see continuing tension or whether there's an opportunity. Uh, it's a very complex question. Uh, it's a very complex question. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Just teasing. Uh, of course, it's very complex. Uh, so let, let me try to kind of uh, parse that a little bit and say, and say a few things. So first of all, obviously, um, COVID is the great humanitarian challenge facing the entire world right now, second only or maybe sort of on par with as a general proposition climate, the difference being that COVID is more acute, climate is more um, uh, structural and long term. Um, everybody is going to need the vaccine from the president of the United States to the youngest refugee in the longest sort of serving refugee camp in the world. And I think Hugo is exactly right, particularly given the, the challenges of, um, of the Pfizer vaccine, for example, that requires you know, massive cold storage. I mean, how, how do we do this? Um, if ever there were uh, a time for us to think about uh, global cooperation on a massive scale, like this is it. 
And so I hope, not unlike, quite frankly, response to the Ebola crisis um, in West Africa in 2014, that this will lead to some uh, necessarily um, uh, cooperative arrangements, which, you know, help to build trust. You know, one of my mentors told me a long time ago uh, that in diplomatic action, as a general proposition, the coin in the realm is trust, and you cannot surge trust. You have to build it before you need it. Now, the corollary to that is that there are some times, like the one we're in right now, where you simply don't have a choice. Um, and I suspect that whether it, whether it is who's going to distribute the COVID vaccine in North Korea, or what's going to be the relationship between um, distribution of, of COVID vaccine in, um, in Iran, Cuba, uh, pick your places where there are any number of very kind of hostile political relationships. We're going to have to figure this out. Now, with regard to the tension you just said, this is actually not new or original. Um, certainly from the American perspective, um, you know, U.S. Um, humanitarian assistance has responded to earthquakes uh, in, in, in Iran that has responded to food disasters in North Korea. Um, even while there have been really quite profound uh, political challenges. Uh, and quite frankly, um, and I say this again as uh, someone um, who's represented my own country proudly, um, the notion of trust in American motives uh, is not new. Um, it's, it, it, is, it is one that, you know, for various reasons, some good, some less good, um, has absolutely pervaded um, uh, views of American action across the board. What is more relevant in my view, is how we, like, these are not binary choices. It's more like sort of a Venn diagram, right? And sort of how do we figure out where are those spaces where we can cooperate for the purpose of not only sort of common good on the basis of shared normative values, but on the basis of very sort of practical, tangible interests. Uh, but that requires, amongst other things, a mindset of a government that at least presumes that such an intersection on the Venn diagram actually exists, rather than a more Manichaean world uh, in which um, ne never the twain shall meet. And eventually, as I say, um, the nature of actions over time will build up trust. So I'm actually re very confident that the incoming administration uh, will operate on that basis. What I'm less confident of is whether or not we will be able to sustain that over time. Let me just kind of say one last thing um, to respond to Hugo's comments. I learn something new every time I hear, I, I, he could read the phone book and I'd still learn something new uh, from his comments. Um, I think he's absolutely right with regard to um, the refocus on, uh, on climate uh, as an enduring um, uh, issue. I would, however, um, say that I don't, I mean, the, the issue of, of, of conflict as a construct for humanitarian action clearly is not over, um, whether it be because of the persistence of refugee uh, populations that have existed for decades or our, our abject failure to resolve conflicts like Syria. Uh, over, you know, closing in on a decade now, um, uh, you know, in, you know, my wife's birth country, Ethiopia, um, we see uh, one hopes that this conflict's going to be over very quickly. History tells us that's not likely to be the case. Um, and so um, for, for me, one of the, the, the big issues is one of, the, one of the wholesale reforms that has to happen in the humanitarian system is, is a complete rethink about the nature of conflict resolution. Because as my old boss told me when I was at the State Department, there are no there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems. There are only political solutions to humanitarian problems. And what we are seeing increasingly is the continued failure of our current structures to be able to resolve these sorts of conflicts on an engaging basis. That more than anything else, more than a rebalance of global geopolitical uh, power, is in my view what calls for a fundamental rethink of this. So thanks. I'm going to pick up. A completely different issue, and it's this issue of whether um, kind of this year is a burning platform for local humanitarian action. And Ben, you talked about it um, in that you know there's a lot more recognition of of local responders. Nasra talked about you know the huge mm -hmm. amount of activism that is happening within communities. But yet, from the traditional system, there's 0.1% of funding is, is going through the traditional channels to local responders. So I think, you know, we talk about this a lot and we, there's great recognition of, of local actors now within the humanitarian system. And we're talking about decolonizing the system and new models being required. 
but actually the traditional system is not shifting. Um, and there's a number of questions in the, the, um, the questions and answers about this, about how we can actually force a reset, how we can you know, get to what Hugo was talking about in terms of getting the international actors to step back. So maybe Nasra, for you first to, um, to, to talk about this a little bit more, um, whether the new politics, I guess, that we're seeing within the humanitarian sector is also an opportunity and whether it will force international actors to step back um, and to give more space and to give more opportunity to, to local responders or whether we need national governments to take a firmer line with international responders to, to reset. So I guess, I'm, yeah, how do you think it could happen? Well, I mean, I think uh, we've, been, we've been struggling with that, right, for the last um, decade, if not more than that. Um, I know in my last post five years, we were at the issue of bringing this, you know, for lack of a better phrase, warring parties together, international NGOs, local NGOs in the same country, providing the same kind of services and saying, why can't you get along? I mean, truly and honestly, if you care about the community at the end of the day, why can't you partner in a more holistic way, in a more safe way, in a more balanced way? And I think every year that we've engaged with this, what I kept learning, unfortunately, to, to Hugo's call for stepping back is actually more than, rather than stepping back, they stepped up more that international NGOs dug deeper, that they actually pushed more against local actors than I've ever seen, you know, uh, at a time that I was in East Africa. I, it bewildered me and I couldn't understand it, but I think that just showed those of us who were new uh, and maybe did not do our history and did not do our learning very well, power doesn't back away. Systems of structure of all the isms you can imagine in humanitarian settings and settings that are more ravaged by other kinds of conflict. I mean, power doesn't back away. Power is, is embedded for a long time. And so um, I, I come away from that experience sort of thinking, why did we think as local actors that we could change these uh, systems that have been enduring for a long time or that we could change them in a short amount of time. And so what I know now to be true is that actually for local actors, they've got to organize. They have to make a movements. Movements have changed and tipped over power, injustices, um, you know, hate, all the things that we don't want to see in our community. And I have not seen any one organization in about the hundred that were under my umbrella ever walk away. If anything, during times of crisis, their funding went up, tripled, quadrupled. And they brought more staff when they had capable community members available, capable local actors begging for work, begging for equality. And so um, I, I, I have a very grim uh, view of these things. And I think to be very blunt, um, you've got to organize. If local actors are needing to take back their space, including, I mean, a local actor, uh, as I was told by the Somali government, we're a local actor first. So it's not just the local NGOs, we're also part of that local front. Uh, they will take space and they will do it through a different kinds of um, restrictions. And we're seeing much more, you know, shrinking is one way people have described it. I think it's the closing of space for any international actor in places like Somalia that have already have uh, uh, not only protracted crises, but also just inaccessibility to communities, even in urban settings, let alone rural settings. And so um, there is no view other than empowerment, other than activism, other than real grassroots movement, and which includes, which I will keep saying, a movement of love. I have not seen a in single international NGO under my belt that has said, we've been listening to these local actors for years and years and years, not getting safeguarding support, not getting any kind of resources, having their staff die year after year, because as we know, if you're looking at insecurity, the group that dies the most are the people of the community who are also working in local international and uh, local NGOs. And, and nothing, you know, it was celebrated during a humanitarian day in August, but that's about it. And so I'm, I believe in the power of organizing and a power of love at a grassroots level than I do in systems of power, reading themselves into civility, reading and being woken up because of this pandemic in 2020. I doubt it. I'd love to be surprised, but I doubt it. Then maybe coming back to you a little bit, a quest, there's a question here about you know, are new models of interaction emerging? Are we seeing new forms of humanitarian action? And I'm wondering, you know, just building on what Nasra said, um, how, where, you know, you need to organize, 
you need to take action um, and that we, you know, in effect, um, national actors need to claim the space. I'm just wondering, you know, in your analysis of what has changed, are you seeing new models emerging that might offer some potential? Um, you talked a lot about the resistance to change, but I'm interested to hear um, whether you're seeing new models emerging. Thanks, Susha. Um, I think there are new models emerging, but I think they're not necessarily under the province or linked to the humanitarian sector. Uh, I think, you know, the, it, it, a lot of people talk about empire and the traces of empire. And if the humanitarian sector is an empire, then it's somewhere between the kind of stages of having a, a strong hold of an empire towards something like a commonwealth. And there's some, but I think there's actually quite a spectrum and there's some countries that are already in a self-determined mode and they're already operating in that way. But it's whether or not, the, the question is whether or not you think the humanitarian sector has got a role to play for a self-determined, nationally-led humanitarian response. Um, and, I, and I think there's probably a few different ways in which you can imagine the kind of role of the sector. And, you know, there's this often, uh, often used analogy of the humanitarian sector as a vehicle, you know, and what seat are we in? We want to stay in the driver's seat. Do we want to stay in the driver's seat regardless of the fact that we're shedding passengers and the wheels are coming off? Or do we let local actors drive? But actually, if we let a local actors drive at the moment, we want to switch to the front passenger seat and act like a driving instructor with dual controls. Or do we become a navigator armed with a metaphorical version of Google Maps? Or do we sit in the back seat, make brum brum noises and pretend to be driving the whole thing ourselves? Or do we get out of the car and look at the wider options? And I, I for one, would like us to get out of the car and look at the wider options of how we actually get from A to B. And I think where that's happening, it's not necessarily because of the support and the enabling efforts of the humanitarian sector. Interestingly, some of the countries that have most done the most to advance their own national disaster management and COVID recovery efforts have done so with the support of, well, obviously domestic support, taxation, but where they've had international support is from the, been from the development side of the system, not from the humanitarian side of the system. It was the German government that invested in Mozambique's National Disaster Management Agency's weather reporting system, that amazing system of, of um, you know, that HQ full of technology and weather, weather anticipation and so on. That was supported by the German government's development wing. The, the Indonesian government's getting support for its disaster management work through, through a whole range of bilateral support mechanisms as well as local investment. So the question we have to ask ourselves isn't whether or not it's happening, is what do we think the role of humanitarian principles are, have to play in this new world? And I think there is a role. I think there is a need for neutrality, for impartiality. National societies of the Red Cross are going to carry on playing a really important role. In fact, it's interesting that they haven't come up yet in the discussion because they actually sit in between the North and the South. They, they bridge the chasm and actually have done most work to try and be that intermediary than perhaps any other organization that I can think of. It's more a case of what role do we see for these principles and for the, you know, is it an archaic, outmoded and soon to be uh, discarded relic of the 19th and 20th century? Or is it a system that actually has relevance in the 20th century, 21st century, which means being more open, more networked, more humble. And I think there are some instances here and there of this happening, but it's happening again, just to reinforce at the behest of individuals that are doing it despite the system rather than because of it. And the costs of them doing that, of speaking to the system and telling this formal system what they, what the system needs to hear and then being creative and empowering on the other end, it, people burn out. People are suffering a huge amount because of the, that kind of dichotomy of having to be real at the one end and then speak to the machine at the other. And we need to give more support to the genuine human, humanitarian entrepreneurs in our system that are willing to support and enable and facilitate a new kind of humanitarian action, a, a less Swiss, more local, more national, more brown-faced, more female, more, you know, there's a whole range of things that we need to see shifting. And I think for a large part, the world is doing it for itself rather than waiting for the humanitarian sector to, to make it happen.
Interesting. Hugo, do you want to come in on this question of the principles? I think there's been a lot, lot of debate this year about the humanitarian principles and real questioning as to whether neutrality in particular is actually, you know, an instrument that locks out a whole swathe of humanitarian actors and humanitarian action. And that actually, you know, some people saying that it's a, it's a racist principle in some ways because of how it operates, but others is suggesting actually that, you know, you can't, irrespective of the politics of it, you just can't expect local actors to be neutral. You know, there are these communities where atrocities um, are, are occurring and you can't expect uh, neutrality in these contexts. So I'm, yeah, when you say that the Swiss model needs to be reconsidered, how far uh, do the principles need to be reconsidered within that? So I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, um, and I would agree with, with Ruben very much, you know, we know that the incidence of conflict is going up. So we are seeing an increasing number of conflicts again, which is tragic. And we don't know what will happen with the new geopolitics, whether big powers will be content to operate with sort of sub threshold proxy wars that you know, mean they never clash or whether they will clash one day. We just don't know where that stands. So, you know, for the principles, those core principles, you know, the ICRC model, I think that's absolutely right in conflict. And we, we need to keep that for certain key players. What, what worries me is that, you know, a lot of the, com the, the, the problems people face, the kind of vulnerability that Ruben started talking about and that, that Nasra talked about that individual people play face is often much more emerged sort of vulnerability of climate, poverty, you know, now COVID, recession, uh, et cetera. Now we don't need, you know, those sort of Red Cross principles for a lot of that. It, it puts people in boxes and they say, oh, but I can't work too closely with the government because I'm a this, that and the other, and I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, actually that's not relevant in that situation. That's the world we're walking into. And you know, these organizations should get rid of some of that stuff in some of these contexts and realize they need to partner, they need to empower, they need to be part of a, you know, of a national network, the way that um, Ben and Nasra have just described. So I think I'm not saying chuck out the principles if you're working in conflict and war, because I think sometimes that does work for the, for the big agencies. They, they don't usually get very far. They get about 50% access, as I said, and there's all sorts of things they can't do even with that principled model. Um, in, in conflict, I've also said before that I think, you know, it's, it's fine not to be neutral. If you're actually on one side operating a new, a, 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 an important humanitarian life-saving role, you don't have to be neutral you know, great if you're part of that part of society and you're saving lives and, and et cetera. So my point is that a lot of the work that's actually coming on, and this applies to protection work too, which is more and more humanitarian agencies do protection. It's not about protecting people from massive violence and attacks and, um, you know, being killed. It's chronic poverty protection work with people whose lives have been destroyed and hurt by conflict and other things. It's much more in the nature of, you know, gender-based violence, protecting um, people from trafficking, trafficking people from, you know, being kicked out of a place because they don't have land rights. That's chronic poverty work. I mean, you don't need to be neutral for that. You, you're doing development there. You're doing human rights work. So, you know, be more realistic about what you're doing. And when you're really working in a conflict and doing all sorts of things, okay, principles. But when you're really in a chronic situation, of degraded environment, um, poverty, um, government dysfunction and stuff, and get out of that box and, you know, do other things, go solidarity route, um, engage with, with government much more explicitly to try and change things. Um, that's what I'm saying. We, we're all stuck in this principle box and every time we use that here at humanitarian, we all have to do these principles. We don't actually, it depends on the situation. <laughs> Interesting. I think that's something that's really shift, shifted in the last five years is just a real kind of reinterrogation of the principles and a real questioning as to one, whether they work and two, whether they're for all. And I think, yeah, you know, when I was part of this, you know, kind of a certain dogma that we all need to try to subscribe to them. Um, but I think that's really changing now and, and kind of opening up in terms of how they can, how they function and how they don't function for different mm -hmm. actors. I want to, Ambassador, I want to come back to you because one thing that came out very strongly in um, relation to European governments and perhaps some of their work on refugee issues in the aftermath of the so-called refugee crisis um, in Europe, so after 2015, 
um, when Europe found uh, refugees and migrants coming to Europe. Um, in the aftermath of that and the closing of, of effectively closing of uh, European borders and deterrence um, towards uh, refugees, there was a real, I guess, diminishment of the influence that European governments had in other countries in their efforts to promote refugee rights or to you know, ask different countries that were hosting refugees to continue to support them and to include them in their domestic uh, services. And I'm wondering how you see this playing out in the US, um, you know, the US um, being a leader in terms of the rule of law and democratization and, you know, supporting governance efforts internationally. Um, and given what we've seen and what's still playing out now in terms of US politics, how do you see, um, I guess, US leadership on some of these agendas being influenced and what difference do you think that will make? What do, what would you predict that we'll see? Sure. Um, it's going to take me a little while to answer that question. Um, so I'm going to bring several threads together, but I'm going to do my best to be uh, succinct. Nobody wants to be a refugee. Nobody wakes up in the morning or no kids and they're playing with their sandbox and their toys. You know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to go get on a rickety boat that, you know, carrying 10 times the capacity of is designed to do and go, you know, test my fate on the open ocean. Um, I was deeply moved by Nasra's um, testimony of her personal journey. Um, I have spent time in virtually every refugee camp on the continent of Africa. I've spent time with refugees uh, in Obok Djibouti who were about to sort of make the, the the treacherous journey across the Red Sea. I've worked with those that have counted the bodies that have washed ashore. Nobody wants that. And the only reason that a mother would take an infant child and risk that sort of journey is because she believes that as perilous as that is, that is the better choice from whatever is waiting behind her. And so if you presume that, then the reason people are fleeing are kind of for three basic things. They cannot see a, a place of both safety and even a modest form of prosperity for themselves where they are living. Because of the nature of conflict, the nature of persecution, the severe lack of economic development, or because of the, um, the ravages of nature. And so the first order of business ought to continue to be for us as an international institution to figure out how people can find dignity and hope and prosperity where they live. That is the first effort. It ought to be, frankly, whether it be anti-poverty efforts, as Hugo mentioned, uh, consistent conflict resolution measures, and then obviously, finally, you know, all of us working together on this chronic problem of climate change. Um, now, that will not be solved tomorrow. And as a result of that, we have to have workable frameworks um, for those that are legitimately sort of fleeing. And the answer cannot be to simply push people back out to sea or to separate children from their borders. Let me kind of tell you two personal stories as related to this. So my wife is a refugee, came to the United States as a refugee from Ethiopia after the fall of Emperor Haile Selassie, one of only um, 10 families to get out of Ethiopia to come to the United States that year, came with nothing but the clothes on their backs and two suitcases. She is now a double board certified critical care physician who spent the last six months on the front line of the COVID response as a frontline general helping to save lives. So this notion that quite frankly, we hear in the United States perpetrated first and foremost by the president, the sitting president of the United States, that all refugees are, are you know, rapists and criminals who are coming to suck the blood, lifeblood out of America is both empirically wrong as well as morally dangerous. And we need to frankly do a much better job of telling those stories in the second I literally, so here I am on my mountaintop in Tennessee, where the University of the South is located. 
uh, we just finished celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday and my family and I went back to um, uh, Northern Virginia outside of Washington, DC, uh, where we have extended family to spend with them. Masked, socially distant, all that kind of stuff. I just drove back from Washington, DC to Swanee yesterday. It is a 12 hour drive just from those two places. There is a lot of land in the United States of America, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> We have a lot of space <laughs> and we absolutely have the capacity to welcome others who are willing to come and work, who simply want safety and who want to sort of be able to contribute to the American dream and in so doing go back and contribute to their home countries. And what is standing in the way of that is a nationalistic narrative that places walls up between us and them which is not the same to say that every sovereign country absolutely has a right to defend it, to define its own borders and who comes in. Absolutely we do. It's actually much more of both a moral argument about how much more we could be doing both to support people where they are living abroad and also to be more welcoming of those who are coming in. And that is not even a political question to Hugo's point and Ben's point, that and Nasra's point as well. That is a moral, normative, communitarian question. And frankly, I count myself as one uh, who will actively and consistently is actively working on that fight. Uh, because how you answer that question drives all the policy questions thereof. And quite frankly, from the US perspective, we've been there before. We helped to welcome in you know, tens of thousands of refugees from conflicts all around the world. Um, we can continue to do this and we can continue to be a leader to help encourage our other, country, our other partners in Europe, um, uh, in other countries in, in Africa, as well as in uh, you know, sovereign countries in, uh, in, in Latin America to be doing more in this space. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to continue to do so. Thank you. That's really powerful stuff. And maybe just turning back to you, Nasra, because I think you know the testimony that you brought to this um, was also really powerful. But one of the questions that has come out um, from from our uh, audience is around language and when whether this kind of language of crisis is actually unhelpful, um, you know, a refugee crisis, a situation in crisis, and how do we change these narratives? A little bit back to what Hugo was saying as well around kind of the message. Um, I'm wondering, yeah, how do we form a new language? You know, talking about your expert needing more love, more love for, you know, recognition of the love that you want to build on the love for your community, but also recognizing the sacrifices that many uh, local responders are, are taking. And so just wondering, how do we get to, a, I guess, a, a different narrative that is more embracing of love, of solidarity, of some of these kind of common issues of humanity um, so that, yeah, we can recognize the contributions that refugees are playing in, in many countries and not just in the US um, and that we can mo move towards a new understanding of solidarity. I'm wondering, yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, thank you. I think <clears throat> it is really important to interrogate language just on its own, whether we're dealing with a crisis or not, because often we have seen a certain narrative uh, about who's marginalized and who's doing the marginalization that has, you know, um, not only filled our minds and hearts, but has actually filled our history as well. And it has not been the complete history. If anything, it has actually botched out, erased many, many beautiful um, stories from communities that perhaps don't speak English, perhaps don't use the same language to communicate. If anything, um, I think it has made, uh, it has shrunk. I think Ben was talking about innovation. It has shrunk, uh, and Hugo as well, our ability to be creative our ability to look at new models, our ability to, to iterate year after year and say, what is it about these crises that are happening near us and far from us? And why is it that we're not getting to the impact that we so want, that we so badly need, either for a donor or for our own selves? Um, and so uh, I would say the, the first thing I've always questioned is authors and languages describing people that may look like me, may sound like me, or people that ultimately every organization says we put first, we call them beneficiaries, we call them our clients, we call 
problem, the people at the end of the spectrum, the people whose mere existence is the reason why we're able to be actors, we're able to be humanitarians. And so I would say, in addition to power, the first thing to question and to interrogate is language. Whose language are we describing these you know, uh, crises and, and, and problems that we're seeing around the world? And then ultimately, who's, who's doing the writing? Who's, who's doing the policymaking? It's been one of my biggest issues as we've talked about localization, even myself saying, I've got to stop using that word because we are othering. We are othering the key um, actors who we need badly, who are proximate. They are closest to the community we so dear uh, uh, love and want to talk about and want to support, but yet they get marginalized because we call them local actors. Um, I think to me, one of the other things that's so astounding and, and, and I heard it very well from the ambassador is, you know, yes, nobody wants to be a refugee, but I also think at some point in 2020, if anything, it has taught all of us is there are people who are quite rich who are still refuge in their homes, can't go out, can't go out, are not able to get the vaccine they so dearly could afford if they wanted to put money and throw it at problems. Um, there's something about this year where I think, again, we have come together in a global and almost a universal vulnerability. And that my wealth and my ability to be healthy and my ability to uh, survive is so tied to someone else who I may not be able to know, who I may not be able to speak the same language, but who definitely presents to me the same risks that I think everyone else around me does in terms of spreading this virus. And so, um, <clears throat> what can I say? I, I, I do go back to love because love is that thing, even as a, at an organization, you can really change your whole due diligence. You can change how you fund if you're a funder. You can change how you implement if you call yourself an implementer simply by interrogating what is it about this community that you so want to have an impact on if you are not near them, if you don't speak their language, if you don't use their stories, if you don't know their history. And yet we have this audaciousness about calling ourselves humanitarians. It's, it's bewildering to me. So, you know, I am betting on love as a governing principle, personally, professionally, as a policy, as a governing principle, I would add it to the principles that we so uh, desperately need to make relevant once more as we, as we go into the, the, the new year. But to me, um, we, need, we need to really stop with the old narrative and the old languages. And we need to just start anew and, 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 and just not even just be humble, but just if we have to step away, step away, but let people who are needy also be their own best support, be their own heroes, be their own humanitarians. And if all you have to do is provide money and you have that capability, go ahead and do it. But oftentimes you definitely have to step away. You've pretty much answered my next question, which was my closing question to all the, the panel. And maybe we'll we'll start with you, Hugo. But that was what was the one thing that either we need to take from 2020 um, in order to see change in the humanitarian system, or we need to definitely leave behind. And I think you know, we'll come back to you again, Nasra, but certainly this quest for, for love is something I'm hearing very strongly from you. But Hugo, yeah, in terms of what would we bring with us from 2020 or what do we definitely need to leave behind from 2020 in order to, to see change that you think is important and necessary for, for the humanitarian system? What's the one thing you'd point to? Well, I think the one thing would be to use the momentum of you know, this global experience of all understanding what it means to face disaster, seeing climate coming down the road at us, climate disasters more, and you know, we're talking about the system here. So I would, I would say, you know, ask the big agencies to be brave enough to change their business model now and not just to continue taking the sort of OECD system money for their own organizational perpetuity, but actually to think differently about what social movements that have emerged, what new space that has opened up means and change the business model, do something different. Do something different and do you think i mean we had a conversation as hpg with a number of of the big ingos asking them was this year a burning platform um, and many of them you know answered no they said you know they don't see um it being a burning platform that needs continue that there's a requirement still for international action and so they didn't see themselves as having to change their business models so i guess yeah uh, in asking the big agencies to change. So in, 
What do you think will force them to change? To me? Yeah, yeah. back to you. So, so I think actually what Nasra was saying earlier is that sort of a much more collective action by um, organizations on the ground who are better placed now, who have, you know, achieved new autonomy, new agency, um, new organizations during this year, and actually to insist that actually they, you know, they take the money more directly or that these agencies deal with them differently. Um, otherwise, explore South-South cooperation, you know, mm. see what China and India are going to do. And in some ways, the OECD model should be careful because it's set up so many great, you know, organizations, norms, expertise. But um, if they get it wrong, um, then the South-South channel will become much more dominant. And I think that will show in the vaccine rollout because I think, you know, China will, you know, do, do incredible work along the Belt and Road initiative to, to roll out Chinese vaccines and others to people, and they will set up their own systems. So I think it is a telling time now. And um, the OECD body model and its expertise needs to survive. Um, so it needs to, needs to change. Thank you, Hugo. Turning to you, Ambassador, the same question, I guess. Yeah, what do we, what do we take from 2020 or what's the one thing we need to desperately leave behind um, if you're looking to the future and you want to see some optimism? I want to end on an optimistic note. Um, yeah, what's your one takeaway or leave behind to, to leave us on an optimistic frame? But man, it was a hell of a year. <laughs> I hope it gets better. Um, I mean, look, I think, you know, quite frankly, um, uh, 2020 has showed us a few things um, that are positive. The first is that when faced with a really hard problem, we can rise to overcome it. I mean, we are coming out with vaccines that are developed in nine months time against a, uh, um, uh, a pathogen that, we, that is, uh, yet, is yet not, not known to, uh, to humankind with a 95% of efficacy rate. That's unbelievable. Um, and it shows that when our back's up against the wall, we can actually do some really hard stuff. And I would hope, um, and, we, and that we can innovate. I mean, the fact that we are having this meeting on Zoom right now with people from all over the world um, uh, in a way that quite frankly, you probably wouldn't have done really two years ago is extraordinary. And so my hope is that we will continue to push away things that, well, we just can't find a solution. We just can't figure out a way to deal with persistent refugee problems. We just can't sort of figure out a way to you know, get behind a, a climate consensus. We just really can't find qualified minority women candidates to support our issues. It's all, no, <laughs> we can do these things. We enforce, we've kind of pushed ourselves hard enough. And my hope is that this will do, develop a greater sense of both resilience and kind of can-do spirit uh, going into 2021 and beyond. Thank you. I'm beginning to feel very inspired. Ben, over to you for more inspiration and optimism. I'm determined to end this year on a positive note. So over to you. And you're, you're still on mute, Ben. Thanks, Sosha. And I want to speak to optimism or that call for optimism with a refer reference back to a previous ADI dialogue that Sara Pantaliane chaired, which is specifically about the need for leadership in the pandemic crisis response. And there were a number of um, luminaries on that uh, meeting too, from the WHO, from the NHS, representatives of African governments. And we distilled our collective thinking about what, what it would take to really enable adaptive change. And we came up with the four, four criteria, we, uh, the four A's as we refer to it. One was that we really need to anticipate the need for change, the trends that were driving change and the options for change. The second is that we needed to be able to articulate those needs and trends and options in, in, in a way that really built collective understanding and the support for action. The third A was adaptation, so that you have continuous learning and adjustment of the responses as necessary. And then finally, you need some kind of accountability for change, some means in which you can ensure maximum transparency and a means by which decision making processes are open to challenges and to feedback. Now, in all of the changes that I've seen in the last 15, 20 years of working in the humanitarian sector, we don't, we've missed those four A's. We do some of the anticipation, we do some of the articulation, we don't adapt and we don't hold ourselves accountable for change. And I think that's really, if we're serious about it, 
let's be serious about it and let's say that's what requires change. Otherwise, it will end up being more of the same, I fear. But I think the positive note is what we do in this crisis response, as the ambassador noted, it will have repercussions for years and decades to come. That, that is without question. Um, we need to make sure that if it is our collective future that's on the line, we need to try and face that with, with love, with creativity, with empathy. So let's, tr let's try and put our best foot forward. I mean, it's the least we can do. Thanks, Ben. And Nasra, you have the, the final word. I think you've, you've led us all with, um, you know, a plea for, for empathy and, and for love. So, yeah, uh, over to you for the final word. Thank you, Sorsha. And really, thank you, everybody. I've learned uh, a great deal from just listening to everyone. Uh, I don't have the magic bullet. I'm really just drawing on what I held on to the last uh, nine months, but particularly the last year. And, and it has worked for me personally, and I would say it's working for everybody. But this, this event of 2020, despite how it has broken many systems, I think, and it's broken many lives, it is not, uh, you know, it's not easy to just look away at the nearly 2 million people that we've lost. Um, but at the same time, as the ambassadors and others said, we've had, we've, we've sort of shown our humanity, our ingenuity, our ability to process trauma and come back and be well and, and, and work from home. And many institutions are not able to operate like they would. So we're already seeing adaptation. Um, but, but, you know, it, it is the definition of joy. There are some good parts and there's some deep, deep, deep pains. So uh, in addition to love, I would say also for a particular group, I mean, bank on women. Every one of these organizations that's out there, doesn't matter whether you're a funder, whether you are an implementer, whether you're grassroots, bank on women and women's leadership. There's evidence if you are <clears throat> the kind that's looking for evidence, but there's also just smart economics, bank on women, and particularly bank on black women if you're <clears throat> looking to win uh, or celebrate the, the win of the American um, democracy that's just been saved. And then finally, bank on love, because if anything, the, the crisis I unfortunately do believe will, will get worse, but it's love that's gonna help us get through and come back strong and connect us when we need to be connected more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo, Ben, Ambassador Rigeti, Nasra. It's been a really tremendous discussion. And, you know, I think as I was opening, I was saying it would have been fantastic to have one hour with each of you. And I think we've just touched on these issues. Um, but sadly, we're now out of, of time. And I want to thank everyone who's also tuned in and been really active in the chat. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to do justice to all the questions that have come through, but I've tried to touch on them as we've uh, worked through the conversation. Um, and we in, in the Humanitarian Policy Group, we're looking forward to engaging with you more on, on this and other discussions um, and hope that between now and the new year, where we're hoping for yeah, positive changes that, um, that uh, we can all move forward more in more healthy and, and happy times. Um, we're sharing a chat with you now in the link where you can um, sign up to uh, receive humanitarian policy groups, upcoming events and research, but also where you'll get a recording of this event if you want to listen back or share it. But for now, wishing you a, a very good end of 2020 and uh, looking forward to engaging more in 2021.